Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you all had a good lunch, and um, but you didn't eat too much, so we can sort of move our pace um, this afternoon. Um, it's never a good thing to eat too much when you have work to do. <laughs> yes, we are here this afternoon um, to have a hearing on the human rights situation of migrant and refugee children and adolescents and families in the United States of America. Um, so um, this, this um, hearing was requested by the petitioners a list of a body of persons, so I wouldn't go over the names. We just use up too much time. It's there in the records. Um, um, you will have 20 minutes. Do we, can, do we have 20 minutes? 2020. 2020. We're starting late. Yes, yes we, we, we can short the questions. 15, 15, 15. We've been doing that all day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. 20 minutes um, for you and 20 minutes for the state. I see faces again from this morning. Um, so thank you with that. Could you please start? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Pauletti. I direct the Transnational Legal Clinic at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm here to introduce the testimonies being presented on behalf of a broad national coalition of organizations working alongside and on behalf of children and families who have fled their home country seeking safety and opportunity in the United States only to be met with detention, family separation, interference with their right to seek asylum, and a lack of due process. On behalf of our entire coalition, I want to thank the Commission for its ongoing attention to the persistent human rights crisis that arriving and recently arrived migrants confront in the United States. Members of our coalition first appeared before this honorable commission in 2008 when we first encountered this crisis. And in fact, we have a, uh, several of the petitioners here have a case pending on abuse that took place in a child detention facility in that year. We've presented again in 2010, 2011, and 2014. Unfortunately, while the situation has shown signs of improvement following the commission's 2010 report on detention and due process, the pendulum has swung back and rights violations persist in ways that reveal systemic and pervasive flaws in the way the United States treats immigrants with claims to asylum and other forms of immigration protection, as this commission recognized in the findings issued in its most recent report in the fall on unaccompanied children and family detention. While our testimony and written submissions focus largely on the experiences of Central Americans arriving at the U.S.-Mexican border, who do make up the majority of immigrants subject to the policies and practices we are discussing, these experiences are not necessarily unique to that population. I want to begin by reading the testimony of a mother detained at Berks, obtained by Human Rights First. Quote, I came to the United States and asked for asylum. I was detained for 20 days with Border Patrol, and then I was reunited with my daughter at Berks. I never imagined that in the United States they would have these detention centers where they incarcerate children and their mothers. My daughter had an intestinal infection from the food they gave her at Berks. She had a very, very high fever and they only gave her water. She started to have convulsions because of the fever. When they started, they sent us to a nearby hospital. When we went to the hospital, they gave her a prescription for the fever and another medication for the infection. When I got back to Berks, they took away their prescriptions and said these prescriptions were not necessary. My daughter didn't eat and just cried all the time while we were there. It caused a lot of stress to be in this place. It's so frustrating to not be able to explain to your daughter why you can't leave. She started to eat, but the food wasn't healthy. Hamburgers and hot dogs four to five times a week isn't healthy for a child. My six-year-old child lost 18 pounds. I took her to a psychologist, and my daughter drew houses with no doors and bars on the windows. I understand when a child draws a house with, a, with bars on the windows, they feel insecure. I asked the psychologist, and the psychologist told me that my child was okay, and this was normal behavior. Everything was out of my hands. I couldn't take care of my child. I couldn't give her the medicine. I couldn't give her the favorite food so she wouldn't lose weight. My daughter only wanted to sleep all the time. For me, this is a symptom of depression. The kids are innocent. The kids are innocent of the entire asylum process of the United States. When I came to this country, I never imagined that there would be detention when I came requesting help. The psychological problems caused by being in prison for so long 
and the sadness of not being able to do anything is translated to our children. This is a situation that's hidden from the world." Unquote. We are here today to bring the voices of these women and children out from behind the bars of detention and expedited removal processes as we seek a way forward, beginning with the implementation of the recommendations issued by this commission in its 2010 and 2015 reports. We will hear first from Clara Long, researcher with the U.S. program at Human Rights Watch, who will address the experience as arriving and recently arrived migrant subject to expedited removal. Clara will be followed by Denise Gilman, clinical professor and director of the Immigration Clinic at the University of Texas Law School, where she and her colleagues are representing women and their children who are or have been detained in Carnes in Dilly, Texas. We will last hear from Michelle Bernay, director of the Migrant Rights and Justice Program of the Women's Refugee Commission. Thank you. Members of the Commission, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. Our concerns over due process and the right to seek asylum for families and children began at their very first contact with U.S. government officials. Since 2005, the U.S. has drastically expanded its practice of applying summary deportation processes, known in U.S. law as expedited removal and reinstatement of removal, to migrants it apprehends at the border. In fiscal year 2013, expedited removal orders and reinstatements of prior deportation orders constituted 83% of the total de deportations executed by the U.S. With the expansion of detention capacity for migrant families since 2014, the U.S. chose to begin processing thousands of families with children in these summary procedures, also triggering a requirement under U.S. law that they be detained. Under U.S. regulations, Soon after a family is apprehended and placed in these summary procedures, a Border Patrol agent must certify that he or she has asked the family in a language they can understand the following questions among others. If you are sent back to your country, do you fear you will be persecuted or tortured? Why did you leave your home country? And do you have any fear or concern about being returned to your home country or being removed from the United States? The agent is required to record the answers to these questions in a sworn statement by the migrant, an official government record countersigned by his or her supervisor and eligible for introduction in the court. If this statement includes a migrant's expression of fear, they cannot be deported until they've had the opportunity to explain that fear to an asylum officer in what is known as a credible or reasonable fear interview. My colleague will just address in a moment our rights concerns with this part of the process. However, for now, I want to focus at the border, where children and families report being held in deplorable conditions, and Human Rights Watch and many of our co-requesters have documented fatal protection flaws relating to this initial interview part of summary deportation processes. Dozens of migrants, including among many among 40 detained families who I spoke with at length last year, late last year, told me that Border Patrol uh, never asked them questions about their fear of return. Others told us that they were asked about their fear of return, responded in the affirmative, explaining that they entered the U.S. to flee grave danger. But upon examination, the official transcript of their sworn statement to the Border Patrol agents did not record this fear, instead stating that they came to the U.S. to work. These Border Patrol statements can be used as impeachment evidence later on in front of immigration courts considering asylum claims. The most recent publicly available data obtained via Freedom of Information Act, Act request and analyzed by Human Rights Watch bears this out. The vast majority of families detained by the U.S. Uh, are Honduran, Salvadoran, and Guatemalan. Yet between 2010 and 2012, border agents recorded that only 0.8% of Guatemalan migrants, 1.9% of Honduran migrants, and 5.5% of Salvadoran migrants in these processes had expressed fear. Our recent reviews of border sworn statements of families in detention have revealed situations where U.S. agents appear to continue to incorrectly or falsely record interviews. Sometimes this leads to absurdities. In one case, Human Rights Watch examined a detained baby as young as 11 days old was issued a document recording a statement to an officer that he entered the United States with the intention of going to Dodge City, Kansas to reside and seek employment. Thankfully, and due to sustained pressure by civil society groups, nearly all families in detention are eventually referred for a credible or reasonable fear interview by trained asylum officers. And the difference between the rates of approval of these interviews and the low rates of referral by border agents is staggering. 
In the first quarter of 2015, for example, nearly 90% of detained families were found by asylum officers to have a significant possibility of being eligible for asylum. Members of the commission, the US government should immediately cease applying these summary deportation procedures to families, children, and other vulnerable migrants. This change would not only safeguard due process, but avoid their automatic detention by immigration and customs enfor enforcement and the continued abuses my colleague will now describe. Thank you for this opportunity to address some of the concerns that follow initial processing at the border. As Clara mentioned, since the summer of 2014, <coughs> after initial processing at the border, women and children are sent into detention centers. The decision to send these families to detention is not exceptional, and it is not based on any individualized determination regarding flight risk or danger. Instead, the decision to return to the discredited practice of detaining families in 2014 was based on deterrent considerations, and those considerations still underlie broad family detention. The government continues to insist that it needs to detain families to stem the flow of Central American families fleeing violence, reiterating a message that the families have done something wrong by coming to the U.S. border and urging that they must be sent back quickly when actually international and U.S. law specifically provide for the ability of individuals to seek asylum upon reaching the U.S. The U.S. built this massive family detention system even though the Commission and other international human rights bodies have consistently, consistently concluded that a presumption of liberty should apply and that asylum seekers and other women and children should not be detained except where absolutely necessary when it has been determined in an individual case that there is a real danger that asylum seekers will not appear for hearings or will create a security threat. The very nature of the rapid buildup of family detention and its vast expanse runs directly counter to a presumption of liberty with detention as the exception. Detention is also not necessary here because almost all families have relatives in the United States who are able to host them while they await their hearings. And the families have very strong incentives to appear for their hearings in order to obtain the relief and protection they so need. Any particular family is also detained automatically and arbitrarily. If there are beds available in one of the family detention centers and the demographics of the family presenting at the border or arriving at the border match the demographics that the facility can handle at that moment, then the family is detained. If the family detention facilities can't handle a particular family on the day that that family arrives, then the family will be processed at the border and then released into the country to live in the community while appearing for further hearings in immigration court. Such arbitrary detention necessarily violates international human rights norms. In addition, the arbitrary nature of family detention leads to cruel and unjustified incidents of family separation. Because the facilities almost exclusively, except for Burks, hold women and children only, there are numbers of cases in which families are broken apart. Just on Friday, I worked with a mother from Mexico and her nine-year-old little girl at the Carnes facility. They were here because the mother's 23-year-old daughter, adult daughter, had been kidnapped and raped in Mexico by a drug trafficking organization working very closely with local government officials. Despite the trauma that that 23-year-old young woman is suffering, she was separated from her mother and her younger sister and sent by herself to a different facility thousands of miles away from the family detention center where her mother and young sister are being held. When detained, the families are sent to one of three family detention facilities, just as a little bit of background. There are two very large facilities in Texas, Carnes, with more than 800 spaces to hold women and children. This is a very jail-like facility, cinder block walls, heavy metal doors that you have to buzz into to reach to speak your to your client, x-ray machines. And this facility was recently expanded, not contracted, expanded. Then there's the facility in Dilly, Texas, with 2,400 spots for women and children. This facility is more like a prison camp with trailers spread out across dusty South Texas grounds. And then there's one smaller facility in Pennsylvania that holds approximately 100 people, including fathers as well as mothers and their children. It was previously, before 2014, used as an exceptional facility, but it now has become hardened, more secure, and has recently be found, been found not to be in compli compliance with a license it received from the state of Pennsylvania. Once at a detention facility, 
a family must undergo a credible fear or reasonable fear screening process to avoid the summary deportation that Clara described and instead win the right to appear before a judge and have their asylum claim heard on the merits. Once in this process, the families are detained at least up until the point of the screening interview. Since rulings by a federal court in the summer of 2015 in connection with the decade-old Flores Settlement Agreement that provides protections against detention for children, detention time at the facilities is shorter on average than it was previously than when we were last before you, and most families are released after a favorable screening interview. However, the short average detention times are deceptive in a couple of different ways. First, to arrive at a short detention period of 20 days or so, very brief detention periods are included, but what those short, very short detention periods are is sometimes a rapid deportation where families are not able to properly prepare for and present their claims in violation of their due process rights. In addition, the average times understate the time periods in which particular families are detained. An average detention time of 20 days, which is itself problematic, provides little comfort for a mother and child who are held for months. On Friday, I met a mom and two very young girls, about ages one and three, who had been held at Carnes for two months before finally being released and allowed to pursue their claim. The toll this detention had taken on them was unmistakable. Longer detention periods often take place for families especially who do not pass the screening interview initially and must proceed forward. Uh, given the cursory nature and the complicated legal claims that have to be presented in these screening interviews that must be uh, presented shortly after arriving in the United States. At Burks, for example, most families are detained for four months or more as they fight to have a full opportunity to present their claims in the face of a process that has been made increasingly difficult. I should recall that the, despite the high stakes nature of these screening interviews, not all families have access to counsel to prepare for those interviews. There is no counsel provided at government expense and we face serious limitations in our ability as legal services providers to access our clients at the facilities. I'll note that the harm of even brief detention in these secure, privately run facilities has been well documented. The fact of being in custody destroys normal family relations, guards are in charge while the family is held in huge institutions, sleeping and living spaces shared, making it impossible for mothers to care for and protect their children. And the detention period is not one of processing for release, but is instead one where the families are waiting for a high stakes screening interview that may lead to the possibility of deportation rather than release, leaving families in a state of high alert and stress during their detention that further harms mental health. Medical care has been found to be sorely lacking at the facilities. And just to give you a sense of the types of mental health harm that our clients experience, I have one 18-year-old mother and three-year-old boy who spent a very short time at Dilly of just a matter of, of weeks. And the little boy constantly stresses and, and tenses up whenever he hears a siren because of his experiences with law enforcement in this country. I'll just briefly mention that for those who do obtain release, the human rights violations are not over. There are due process and liberty violations uh, for those who are released, whether they go to a family detention center and are then released, or whether they are released right at the border. Almost all families are being in released on ankle monitors that are placed on the adult, mother, caregiver. These intrusive monitoring devices are imposed across the board as well, without any determination of particular flight risk or danger in an individual case that requires this monitoring. It's extremely problematic once these monitors are placed on a mother to get them off with the 18-year-old mother I just described. We went through months of complying with repeated and changing demands by the private entity supervising the monitor before it was finally removed. In addition, the U.S. has decided to place families on a special fast-track docket that has them set for hearings in their cases very quickly leaving many without adequate notice of their upcoming proceedings or opportunity to obtain counsel and prepare their cases adequately given the complex nature of U.S. asylum law. Finally, beginning this January, the U.S. has targeted women and children who arrived since 2014 who were living in the community as a, and they've been targeted now as a special priority target for deportation through home raids 
that lead to arrest and prompt deportation of families who had removal orders from the immigration court, but who had never had full due process rights to present their claims in those courts. And those rapid deportations leave us with grave concerns about the safety of these families upon their quick deportation home to violent circumstances which they fled. And we'll allow for the conclusions now. I have more that I could say, but I'm sure we'll have time in question and answer as well. I'll be very quick. Um, my name is Michelle Branet. I am the director of the Migrant Rights and Justice Program at the Women's Refugee Commission. Um, I want to begin by thanking the commission for the long-standing interest that the commission has taken in this um, matter. I was, um, I don't know if I want to say honored, to uh, testify on the very first of these hearings in 2008 and again three other times. Um, after the initial uh, resistance to monitoring um, by the commission, we did see some improvements. There were um, attempts to reform detention and the closing of the infamous Don T. Hutto facility uh, in Texas. However, um, in recent years, as you've heard, the pendulum has swung back, but with a vengeance. Instead of investing into protection mechanisms, this administration has invested in detention and deterrence. Reforms have stalled, and in fact, in 2014, the detention of families not only returned, but it returned at a rate that we could not have imagined when we first testified about this in 2008. Um, rights violations persist in many ways, as you've heard, and I won't go into those. Um, we respectfully request that the Commission continue its interest in this issue and also that you follow up with your previous requests and recommendations. Uh, in doing so, we request that the Commission continue to monitor the treatment and human rights and conditions of immigration detention in the United States and consider a follow-up visit. That the Commission seek specific information requested both by the petitioners and by the Commission in 2011 and at past hearings, which as uh, of now have not yet been uh, provided, uh, that the Commission call on the United States to provide detailed information on steps taken with respect to recommendations set forth in the Commission's 2011 and 2015 reports on immigration detention, due process, and asylum seekers in the United States. We also request that the Commission urge the United States to take actions to guarantee the fundamental human rights of refugees and all migrants seeking protection, including eliminating policies of automatic detention and instead implementing a presumption of liberty for all asylum seekers and those who may be eligible for protection. Implementing alternatives to detention that are based on community support and always the least restrictive possible under the individualized circumstances of each case implementing training and policies to ensure humane treatment and, con in, and conditions in all detention facilities and at the border. We also request that the Commission urge the United States to ensure that recently arrived migrants and migrants seeking protection are guaranteed their due process rights and the right to seek asylum, including using discretion so as not to apply summary removal procedures to recently arrived migrants who may be eligible for international protection, to ensure access to legal information and to legal counsel throughout the process and including for children before agreeing to withdraw their request for entry. And finally, to coordinate with civil society to develop a systemic regional solution that recognizes the large-scale humanitarian situation driving individuals to flee their homes and seek safety in the United States. A more detailed list of recommendations has been submitted. Thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for your uh, intervention. Um, I will call on the state to make their statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Distinguished colleagues, dis distinguished commissioners, civil society friends, and colleagues from the Secretariat, my name is Michael Fitzpatrick. I'm the interim permanent representative of the United States before the Organization of American States. We would like to first thank the commission for bringing these matters before us today, and we look forward to continuing our discussion concerning the humanitarian crisis at our border in 2014, the Commission's report in 2015, as well as the various other hearings and working meetings on the human rights of migrants in the United States that uh, the U.S. government has appeared before in, uh, in recent years. The United States is, of course, proud of its history as a nation of immigrants. As the Commission recognizes in its 2015 report, the United States has been the principal destination country for international migrants in the world and is one of the leading countries for granting asylum and resettling refugees. We value the contributions they make to our economy, 
our culture, and our social fabric. The United States can state without hesitation that immigrants have made immeasurable contributions to our nation since this nation's establishment and can be found today in top positions in government, business, media, academia, and the arts. Immigration is an issue of critical importance to the United States and it is, ex is, and it is extensively addressed by U.S. law and policy. As the Commission also knows, international law recognizes that every state has the sovereign right to control admission to its territory and to regulate the admission and expulsion of foreign nationals consistent with any international obligations it has undertaken. This principle has long been recognized as a fundamental attribute of state sovereignty. I won't go into all the different legal arguments today as we've clearly laid them out in our, our position in the June 30th, 2015 response to the Commission's draft report on the human rights situation of refugees and migrant families and unaccompanied children in the United States. But we are happy to share colleagues of that response with our civil society colleagues today um, who have requested this meeting, this hearing. As everyone knows, in 2014, the United States saw a sharp increase in migration from Central America. This was a sudden and dramatic increase. And while it wasn't without challenges, we nonetheless remain proud of our record in addressing that humanitarian crisis, which involved a significant number of unaccompanied children, record numbers. We acted swiftly, reallocated resources, and were able to comprehensively address the issue in a fair and humane manner. Today, you will hear from some of my colleagues from our domestic agencies in more detail on protections afforded unaccompanied minors and receive updates on our ongoing efforts, as, on, excuse me, our ongoing efforts new initiatives, and the continuing challenges that face us. However, before I turn over the floor, allow me a brief summary of the State Department's efforts since the summer of 2014 and recent developments in Central America. As most of you are aware, the United States is currently playing a transformative role in the region through the United States strategy for engagement in Central America. Our efforts build on the continued political will and commitment de demonstrated by our partner governments in the region after all, this is not an issue that the United States can resolve alone in isolation. We must work together as partners to ensure a holistic approach to the challenges before us today. The U.S. Congress provided the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development with up to $750 million in funding in fiscal year 2016 appropriations bill to advance the U.S. strategy for engagement in Central America. The strategy is aimed to advance prosperity, governance, and security objectives to address the underlying conditions that motivate migrants to take this dangerous journey to the United States. The integrated approach under this strategy comes at a critical moment and offers the best opportunity to improve the lives of Central American citizens in their homelands. The United States Department of State is well aware that if we do not seize this opportunity for change now in Central America, Millions will remain mired in poverty and insecurity and seek to flee. Stopping this cycle is something the United States takes very seriously, and the administration recently requested an additional $1 billion in fiscal year 2017 funding to support the strategy and continue these important efforts. However, we also know that there is no panacea that will instantly, significantly curtail undocumented migration from the region. To this end, our strategy is thus designed for long-term success and rec recognizes that we must assist these partner governments as they make the systemic reforms required to address, as was discussed, the underlying conditions driving undocumented migration in the first place. We established an in-country refugee and parole program for citizens of Honduras, Guatemala, and Salvador minors and announced earlier this year plans to partner with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees to expand refugee processing in the region. These efforts and our work with our partners is a clear indication of the seriousness of the situation. We again thank the Commission and the, the petitioners, if you will, um, for bringing this topic before the Commission today. Um, al allow me, please, to introduce my colleagues. To start off, we have Mary Giovagnoli, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Immigration Policy, the Office of Policy at the Department of Homeland Security, as well from the Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, 
Families, we are joined by Tricia Schwartz, Associate Deputy Director, Office of Refugee Settlement. And finally, we have a number of observers who are here to answer particular questions if necessary, including Raina Cutlip Mason and Martha Rothworf, both from the Justice Department's Executive Office for Immigration Review. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mary. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Distinguished commissioners, petitioners, secretariat staff, and colleagues across the government, as well as within civil society. My name is Mary Giovanoli. I serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Immigration Policy at the United States Department of Homeland Security. DHS is responsible for the administration and the enforcement of the U.S. immigration laws, and we do so primarily through three um, of our components, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, U.S. Custom immigration, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. The Immigration Court System is part of the Executive Office for Immigration Review, which is in the Department of Justice, and of course we work closely with them throughout the process. In carrying out our diverse mission with respect to immigration, we are responsible for functions as diverse as helping to protect human rights, securing the border, and facilitating lawful trade and immigration um, uh, enforcement and benefits as well. My office leads the coordination and integration of DHS-wide immigration policies, programs, and strategies where the issues are cross-cutting across the different um, components and departments. I was honored to have the opportunity to participate in your first hearing on the human rights situation of refugee and migrant families and unaccompanied children held in October 2015, and I'm honored to return to provide an update on our efforts to continue to meet the needs of migrant families and unaccompanied children, particularly those arriving at our southwest border with Mexico. I must note, however, that many of the concerns raised by petitioners are currently the subject of litigation in U.S. federal court, and thus I'm precluded from speaking directly to to many of the specifics raised. As the Department of State has noted, conditions in the Northern Triangle countries of Central America, especially increased violence and worsening poverty, continue to be major push factors in driving families and children towards Mexico and the United States. DHS continues to work with the Department of State and others to support efforts to change the underlying dynamic in those countries, but such change takes time. While apprehensions at the southwest border continue to drop overall, we are still seeing a steady stream of families and children arriving at the southwest border. In 2014, those groups overwhelmed available resources for a time, but this is not 2014. We are more prepared, better equipped, and more mindful of the humanitarian challenge at our border. We are offering alternatives to making the deadly journey north. We are addressing the challenge of new migration patterns posed not only at the border or in family residential centers, but also the complexity of the protection and asylum claims raised by many of these individuals. The U.S. government's responsibility to respond to humanitarian needs, to ensure the appropriate treatment of individuals in custody, to carefully consider claims to humanitarian protection under our refugee and asylum laws, and to facilitate repatriation where applicable must always be done with respect and dignity. Caring for those individuals and ensuring their cases are properly handled is a foremost objective for my department and government-wide. As discussed last fall, at President Obama's direction, DHS undertook a government-wide response to address the surge in families and unaccompanied children arriving at our southwest border. We stood up the Unified Coordination Group, chaired by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, administrator, to bring the assets of multiple federal agencies to bear on this urgent situation. This group, which includes the Departments of Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, State, Justice, Defense, and the General Services Administration, remains very active today. Continual, effective communication across the government means a daily assessment of migration patterns, tracking the hours children are housed in CBP facilities, assessment of likely migration scenarios, coordination on the availability of bed space, and timely transfer of unaccompanied children to the care and custody of HHS. In addition to increased bed space of DHS, CBP's capacity to process individuals has also expanded, and we can now transfer unaccompanied children to the custody of HHS expeditiously, generally in less than one day. In February of this year, DHS and HHS signed a memorandum of understanding to further enhance cooperation, ensuring that we have a network and a process for resolving issues quickly. 
Thus, while we hope that the concerted efforts of the U.S. government and our foreign partners will minimize the risk of a 2014-like surge, we're prepared to address it if need be. Many of the initiatives I described in my, test, in my um, conversation and, and testimony before you last year have now yielded concrete results. Our Central American Miners Program, um, referenced by Michael, provides the opportunity for in-country processing in key countries in Central America, and it's providing an alternative to dangerous migration. As of March 28, 2016, the CAM program had received 75, almost 7,600 applications um, for individuals in Central America. Of those um, that have been interviewed thus far, 32% have been approved for refugee resettlement, and about 67% were recommended for parole into the United States. Already 144 individuals have arrived in the U.S. under the CAN program, which includes 46 refugees and 98 parolees. In addition, individuals complete DNA testing before they're ready for U.S. CIS interviews, which in fact does delay the, the ability to, to sometimes move these uh, cases as quickly as we would like, but the, the fact is that we actually are seeing that the program is working and is beginning to, to bring more people into the fold. In addition, we're pleased that this effort will soon be supplemented by a more robust refugee processing program in Central America. Our work on other fronts with Mexico and other partner governments in Central America to discourage unsafe journeys, thwart migrant smuggling and human trafficking, and address the root causes of dangerous migration continue as well. DHS supports fair processes in immigration proceedings and has requested over $17 million as part of the President's fiscal year 17 um, budget request to support critical initiatives that provide legal assistance service to vulnerable immigrants, including $2 million for the Justice AmeriCorps, a program that specifically provides legal representation to unaccompanied minors. We need every element of the court process to work effectively to accomplish both the goals of granting meritorious humanitarian claims and repatriating those who do not qualify for relief. We are also working with the Department of Justice to combat the very serious issues of smuggling that um, accompany many of the, um, the dangers and many of the um, increased risks that we see in the, um, in the additional migration of families and children moving north. And I think that's an actually very critical part of this process. But we've also continued to refine our approach to housing families and processing their cases. In May and June 2015, DHS and ICE announced a series of actions to further enhance oversight and accountability, increase access and transparency, and ensure the operation of family residential centers in a safe and in humane manner as possible. Notably, in all cases involving families, DHS does not invoke general deterrence of illegal immigration as one factor in an individualized custody determination. Additionally, we transitioned um, our, federal, our family residential centers so that the detention of families will be short term in most cases, so as to process individuals for a reasonable time during the evaluation of credible and reasonable fear claims, and to allow for prompt removal of individuals who have not stated a claim for relief under our laws. I see that my time will expire shortly, so I am going to try to move it forward. Um, let me summarize with respect to ICE and its programs that we have have actively increased our alternatives to detention programs um, and have expanded the mechanisms by which we work with individual families and work with um, uh, the social uh, services network to provide more tailored and adjusted um, programs for families as alternatives to detention. Um, and there are many, many other things that we have done, including um, ensuring that our Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Office has been actively involved in investigating claims when they arise um, at our facilities. And in fact, we take very seriously every claim that is made and make every effort to try and get to the root of what's actually happened in specific situations. Um, but finally, I think that it's very important to note that despite what is, I believe, significant progress on many areas, the 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 migration patterns of, um, of the southwest border in particular are incredibly fluid, change um, uh, with any number of other dynamic uh, components, some of which I think that my colleague from state has addressed in terms of the need to actually look at the entire big picture. And there I think there's no disagreement between you know, the government and the, the, um, the petitioners that we must do more in terms of the systemic and deep underlying problems that exist to, to really resolve many of the issues we face. 
this, but I want to end with a quote from Secretary Jay Johnson of Department of Homeland Security, who essentially has noted that irrespective of the very extensive array of protective laws and policies that exist, there will be times when repatriations will occur and in fact are necessary. As Secretary Johnson has said, our borders are not open to illegal migration. If someone was apprehended at the border, has been ordered removed by an immigration court, has no pending appeal, and does not qualify for asylum or other relief from removal under our laws, he or she must be sent home. We must and we will enforce the law in accordance with our enforcement priorities. We will continue to enforce the immigration laws and secure our borders consistent with those priorities and values. At the same time, we will offer vulnerable populations in Central America an alternate, safe, and legal path to a better life. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tricia Swartz, and I'm Associate Deputy Director for the Office of Refugee Resettlement within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. HHS is responsible for coordinating and implementing the care and placement of unaccompanied children referred by federal agencies. These children make a dangerous journey to the United States without their parents, often in the hands of smugglers, coming in search of a better life. Many of the children in our care that we've spoken to um, reference violence, poverty, or other situations for their reason for migration. Clearly, these vulnerable children are in difficult circumstances, and we treat our responsibility for each child referred into our care with compassion and a commitment to their safety and well-being. Our mission has two key parts. The first is to create a safe and healthy environment in our shelters, one that ensures access to nutritious food, clean clothes, education, medical care, legal services, and other services. The second is to identify the least restrictive placement that is in the best interest of the child, usually with a sponsor for each child while they await their U.S. immigration proceedings, subject to considerations of risk of flight and danger to the child or the community. The number of unaccompanied children referred to HHS each year was generally in the range of six to 7,000 until fiscal year 2012. Those numbers increased um, to, to, to 13,625 in fiscal year 12, 24,668 in fiscal year 13, and then to 57,496 in fiscal year 2014. The numbers declined in fiscal year 15 to 33,000, but as many of you know, during the first quarter of this year, we've already received almost 20,000 children. Regarding shelter expansion and preparedness, HHS continues to develop cost-effective strategies. These strategies aim to address the historical variations in the numbers of border crossings by children so that we can meet these changing demands. While our efforts are being made in the, in the U.S. government in collaboration with other countries to avoid large increases in children, HHS has the responsibility to be prepared to provide the humanitarian care. Since 2012, HHS has expanded residential service awards as now, and is now operating more than 100 programs across the country, all while expanding awards for other services too, including post-release services and expanded legal services. Regarding residential care, HHS is now adding contract vehicles in addition to the existing grants. This is in order to provide flexible options for services related to temporary shelters. It allows HHS to use a competitive process to identify providers and expand options. HHS awarded five of these contracts, and they include shelter staffing, wraparound services, training and technical assistance, transportation, medical and clinical services. Regarding stakeholder feedback on our shelters and temporary shelters, we are glad that many of our stakeholders were able to accept our invitation to visit uh, a Texas temporary shelter in the summer camps and a temporary shelter at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. As new sites are engaged in the future, stakeholders will be continue to be invited. We value the work that we do with all of our stakeholders and we appreciate the honest dialogue that comes with this. You have really given us some valuable feedback and we're always looking for ways to improve our policies. For example, in all of our sites, we're doing the best we can to um, improve and enhance educational options. Also, as in the past, while in care, all unaccompanied children are to receive Know Your Rights presentation, explaining their rights as part of the immigration process. 
Children are also screened to determine if they are eligible for legal relief, such as asylum, SIJ, or other status, and they're provided legal service information. As part of a significant expansion recently, many you see are also provided pro bono or direct representation, both while in our care and upon release. For fiscal year 2016, HHS awarded $55 million in legal service contracts, representing an increase of $31 million over the prior year. In December 2014, HHS released an interim final rule on standards to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment involving unaccompanied children, and we are currently in the final stages of that process. Also in recent years, we increased our oversight, including the creation of a dedicated monitoring team. We are in a continuous process to make both operational and policy changes to strengthen the program and services to unaccompanied children, identifying the most efficient ways to use our appropriated funds. We appreciate our partnerships and we value our ongoing feedback. In conclusion, while this program has grown significantly over the past few years, we continue to share your deep commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of unaccompanied children in our care, and we look forward to the continued dialogue. Thank you. Um, my, my gracious thanks to both um, sides um, for your respect for our time and your time. Um, um, before I call on my, on my colleagues, I, if I can just say one thing. I am not too clear um, for instance, you, you say you appreciate partnerships and so on. I'm not too clear whether those partnerships involve working with this group. I, I, I didn't get that clear in my head. Do, do you inform, consult, cooperate, and so on with um, the coalition, for instance? Um, yes, HHS um, works closely with uh, stakeholders. It involves many advocates and non organizations. No, not stakeholders. I'm talking about this group in particular. Yes. Some of the members in this group in particular we work with regularly, <laughs> right. and we um, receive their feedback mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and utilize their recommendations. Perhaps I can clarify a little bit for you. Um, there are several branches of the government being represented here today, so it is absolutely true that we have regular uh, stakeholder, as she refers to the meetings, um, with various branches of the government. I think that there's very clear differences in the levels of cooperation and transparency, depending on whether we're talking about um, Customs and Border Patrol, for example, versus Immigration and Customs Enforcement, both of which are under Homeland Security, and um, Health and Human Services. So there's some level, and then there's definite uh, obstacles. I would also just add that just because they meet with us doesn't mean that they, uh, that we agree. <laughs> well, clearly not from the presentation. <laughs> yes, clearly not. Um, um, I think I will, I will um, Esmeralda, are you ready to intervene? I would, uh, the rapporteur and children um, would like to intervene. Bueno, voy a hablar en español porque es el idioma que, que manejo. Eh, agradeciendo a ambas partes el, el aporte eh, presentado en la tarde de hoy. Eh, es un tema de una altísima complejidad. Eso podemos comprenderlo eh, y muy particularmente el tema fronterizo de eh, México y Estados Unidos y todo el Triángulo Norte con esta, esta problemática. Yo quiero eh, destacar, ambos, ambas partes lo han planteado, eh, detrás de esta realidad, de este fenómeno, de este flagelo, hay una situación... Eh, profundamente de contenido de derechos humanos y muy particularmente los derechos humanos de los niños, niñas y adolescentes. Pero cuando uno habla de los derechos humanos de los niños, eh, creo que es necesario precisar a qué nos estamos refiriendo. Y... y 
mi enfoque es esta responsabilidad que tenemos autoridades, gobiernos, sociedad adulta, organizaciones, con el desarrollo pleno de los niños. La, es, es el grupo humano que está en un proceso de desarrollo que toda situación de afectación de este proceso eh, implica efectivamente una, una, un efecto, una, una limitación. Y yo quiero hacer una, una pregunta y se la puedo hacer a ambas partes. Eh, la valoración que ustedes hacen de los planteamientos que ha hecho particularmente la, la Corte Interamericana con la opinión consultiva 21 en materia de las detenciones como efecto de estos procesos migratorios. Y, 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 y el peso que esto tiene para los estados, para los países. Eh, así que no, no sé si, si eh, logro concretizar el, 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 la pregunta, eh, ¿qué, ¿qué valoración hacen de esta opinión consultiva para, para manejar esta, este, este problema de la detención de los chicos y las chicas en ese momento de eh, la migración, eh, el, el, el proceso eh, de, de migración para establecer efectivamente si se le puede, si se le debe conceder a los niños una, una respuesta. Entonces, me gustaría, eh, bueno, vinculado esto también a todo el corpus juris que, que en materia de la Convención eh, de los Derechos del Niño este, este tema tiene. Sí, después que, después que conteste. Sure. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> question. I'm telling the commissioners they have to be short. <laughs> Buenas, eh, muy buenas tardes para los peticionarios e igualmente para los representantes del Estado. La Comisión celebra en este momento la posición actual de los Estados Unidos porque con su intervención está destacando verdaderamente, como se ha señalado en algunas otras oportunidades por la Comisión, la importancia de la Declaración Americana de Derechos Humanos como fuente de obligaciones para los estados no obligados por la Convención Americana de Derechos. Se destaca que la Carta de la Organización de los Estados Americanos y la Declaración Americana de los Derechos y Deberes del Hombre constituyen fuente de obligación jurídica para los estados miembros de la OEA, incluyendo a los Estados Unidos. Igualmente, se advierte que como Estado parte de la OEA los Estados Unidos tienen la obligación de garantizar los derechos humanos de todas las personas bajo su jurisdicción, sin distinciones respecto de su nacionalidad, situación migratoria o cualquier otra condición social. Esta obligación se extiende a todo ese haz de derechos humanos y fundamentales, como el debido proceso, el acceso a la justicia, el recibir asilo y de la postura y de la presentación precisamente del Estado que se celebra, se ve cómo hay, digamos, una eh, flexibilidad o un reconocimiento a que la fuente, en razón de las fuentes de las obligaciones jurídicas internacionales, los Estados deben implementar una serie de contenidos que precisamente se articulan en la Declaración Americana de Derechos y la manera de hacer efectiva en esa jurisdicción. De suyo, la Comisión ha interpretado desde tiempo atrás la declaración 
eh, americana en el sentido de que los estados tienen la obligación de adoptar medidas para dar efecto legal a los derechos reconocidos en la Carta, que es el corazón del sistema. Asimismo, ya en el informe de fondo John Doe y otros versus Canadá, la declaración se dijo constituía una fuente de obligación legal e internacional para todos los Estados miembros de la Organización de los Estados Americanos. Esa potestad está en el artículo 20, en los artículos 49 y 50 de su reglamento para recibir peticiones. Al margen de este aspecto, que es de suyo muy valioso, porque no se ha discutido en este momento ese aspecto, pasamos al segundo punto que lo voy a bosquejar brevemente. Es la situación de detención de inmigrantes y en el informe del 2015 la Comisión señaló la preocupación que se tenía por la detención de familias inmigrantes. Este aspecto no se ha hecho mucha incidencia, pero para mí es capital. ¿Por qué? Porque la libertad puede ser entendida hoy día como un principio, como un valor y como un derecho. Esa es la concepción de la libertad. La libertad es la condición ideal de cualquier ser humano. Sin libertad no hay persona, sin persona no hay sociedad y sin sociedad no hay Estado. La privación de la libertad por el Estado, al menos la preventiva, debe ser la excepción y no la regla. La intervención del Estado en ese último ámbito irreductible fue destacada precisamente por Becaría en los delitos y las penas para decir que es la última razón sometida a una estricta reglamentación. Los Estados no pueden seguir como el falso ídolo de Zaratustra de que de un lado predican la presunción de inocencia y de otro lado dan al traste con esa presunción. Entonces se ha solicitado que no puede haber detención preventiva automática y generalizada, eso es razonable, eso hace parte de la civilidad. Igualmente, frente al debido proceso, el debido proceso ha sido defendido por los Estados Unidos, su constitución, me corrigen, si en la quinta y sexta o cuarta y quinta enmienda precisamente recoge la importancia del debido proceso. Un principio que viene desde 1215 con el rey Juan Sin Tierra, que fue luego en 1600 es aprobado por el Parlamento inglés y la Constitución americana, de lo, la Constitución de los Estados Unidos lo protege y la blinda. Entonces vemos que el cumplimiento de las medidas en materia de migración, asilo y unidad familiar es un propósito que hoy veo en una perspectiva de eh, favorabilidad, de receptividad por el Estado, que es plausible y que es reconocible, y ojalá puedan trabajar en las soluciones amistosas y en los acuerdos, tanto la sociedad a través de sus representantes con el Estado, porque de todas maneras esas perspectivas de diálogo, de articulación, de acuerdos amigables, van en beneficio no solamente de las víctimas sino o de los ciudadanos, sino que legitiman a los estados en tanto cuanto están cumpliendo con los deberes que nacen de suyo de la convención. Presidente, espero no haberme pasado de tiempo. <risa> Um, thank you. Before you answer, I just want to throw this short question into the pot. And um, this is, um, the, do you have information about the level of education of your border um, patrol people? And what training do they have in relation to the human rights of children and women and men? Um, what, is it possible for us to see the, the training manual um, for this. Um, when I was in the court, we generally asked for this because um, sometimes um, states um, felt that they were given <coughs> sufficient training. But when you look at it from a human rights lens and with a human rights lens, we could identify gaps, a lacuna, um, which would assist. And also the level of education is, is important. All countries, we have that problem. 
um, when, when police officers deal with vulnerable people. Uh, um, their level of education does play a part in how they handle them. And I am concerned about feeding children, um, what was it you said, hamburgers, burgers? I don't believe in fast food at all. I think it's terribly unhealthy, apart from making people fat. It's really not good nourishment. <laughs> so could you comment on that? Do they give them hamburgers? I love chips, I love french fries, but do they give children hamburgers in their menu? Please, when you answer, could you deal with that? Thank you very much, yes, Madam. Yeah. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say. Uh, thank you for your for your comments and your questions. I will say we agree on your interpretations of international law, obviously, and the obligations of the United States under the American Declaration, as well as the importance of OC 21, uh, and and it's why we're here today uh, in thinking about. Uh, where the international obligations, where the United States is falling short on its international obligations. I'm going to turn to my colleagues to address your individual uh, questions specific to um, OC21 uh, and I lost track. And then what's going on at the border? Um, Could well. you take like 80 seconds <laughs> each. Uh, we'll try. Um, so uh, thank you for your questions. Um, uh, we agree, as, as Sarah has mentioned, that the guidelines that have been set out in international law are actually quite clear, um, and that the impact of a deprivation of liberty itself, regardless of problems with medical care and the rest, is particularly problematic for the development of children. Consider the fact that a one-year-old child detained for four months will have very significant development mental mental health impact um, that might be different for, for adults while still problematic for them as well. There's an important clarification that, that I think we, we would like to emphasize, which is that unaccompanied children who come by themselves and accompanied children who come with their parents are treated Similarly, in many ways, at the border, and there are multiple problems with conditions and with the processing at the border that we're very concerned about. After that border processing, their two experiences diverge dramatically. And so the unaccompanied children will go to Ms. Schwartz's facilities, which, while there may still be problems and there are partnerships working on those problems, uh, are, are much um, further along in terms of recognizing the unique needs and rights of children and are really directed towards seeking the release of the kids into their families. Um, and that, of course, makes sense because kids can't just be released at the border the way a child with a parent can. These children have to go somewhere and then be processed for release, and that's really what happens. Children who come with their parents who are not released at the border, which used to be the rule, they would normally be released to go to their hearings, but who are now instead sent to one of these large family detention centers are in a very different situation. They are not being processed for release. They are in very secure law enforcement, liberty-depriving conditions where guards control their movements um, and where there is no real consideration of the best interests of the child as a focal point for the way the detention system functions. And then only after they perhaps pass without the help of any appointed counsel, this very high stakes screening interview, will they be considered for release. And so it's a very different philosophy, physical condition, and process. And those are the ones who we have been mostly um, speaking about today. Um, yes, I think that's the main clarification I wanted to make. You want to talk about the border training? Um, <clears throat> I, I, Thank you for that question. I think it's a very important one. We would also, we, we, we'd very much be interested in, in border training documents and the documents for how these border agents in particular who are conducting the interviews I spoke about um, are uh, directed to, to direct these interviews. Uh, there has been some engagement um, with the government around, um, a, you know, an initial, very initial engagement around, again, dividing un unaccompanied children from accompanied children. So when we talk about unaccompanied children and the processes and interviews that we are also concerned about at the border, um, there has been much more engagement. We've received much more engagement than uh, from the state than when we talk about accompanied children who are, again, going through expedited removal and reinstatement of removal orders, these summary processes 
policies that we believe in themselves cannot be, should not be applied um, to children or to vulnerable mi migrants because of their due process implications um, that, that the members of the commission have also raised. Um, so hopefully that also helps to clarify questions there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and thank the petitioners as well for those clarifications just now. Um, in the vein of clarifying a few things, if I may, the U.S. fully accepts its own obligations to protect and defend the rights of all those on our national territory, uh, especially those most at risk and those underage. We also support, of course, the procedures required for due process, which unfortunately can sometimes drag out the processes far longer than those involved might wish them to uh, to be resolved in. Um, but let me also note that um, a few caveats are in order as well. On the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it is indeed a most important international human rights treaty, one that the United States has signed. It is not yet ratified, however, by the United States. That said, this administration supports the goals of the Convention, which is aimed at protecting the, wealth, the well-being of all children. We currently work in this regard to promote the rights and well-being of all children in the United States including in the areas of education, physical and mental health, and protection from violence through existing local, state, and federal laws and mechanisms. With regards to um, the distinguished comments by the distinguished commissioner, with regards to the uh, American Declaration, I must underscore, of course, that the United States has never accepted the commission's view that the American Declaration, which was adopted by states as a non-binding statement of principles, has somehow been transformed into a source of legal, legal obligations today. Uh, it has not, in our view, it does not itself create legal rights or impose legal obligations on states. While we recognize the good intentions of the commissioners, the commission, and others who assert that view, it is still our belief that it would seriously undermine the process of international lawmaking by which sovereign states voluntarily undertake specified legal obligations. To impose legal obligations where none exist, um, sorry, where none has been accepted through some form of ipsa dixit, uh, we're just not there. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you for your very perceptive um, and I think sympathetic uh, questions regarding the, the complexity of these issues. And, and also thank you to uh, the petitioners for their uh, nuanced thoughts on these, these questions. I think though that uh, I wanna make sure I get to hamburgers and the other issues that you've raised. So, but I wanna start with something broader, which is that I think that it is always, always the case that the goal of any functioning immigration system should be a regular and predictable method for temporary and permanent migration. And it has long been the case, and the Obama administration has fought very hard for this, that we need significant reforms to our immigration laws, both to address the undocumented population in our country as well as to address the um, huge disparity between the uh, demand and interest for visas of all kinds um, to, to this country and, and their availability. Our system is still stuck in many ways back in the late 80s or 90s, um, and that creates problems in trying to administer any other part of the immigration system, particularly when Congress has um, not fully addressed many of the issues that, that have been raised here and that we are consistently asking for more resources to uh, address issues like representation, to address issues like alternatives to detention. And we certainly have learned a great deal from uh, the petitioners, from the advocates in the human rights community and the immigration community, um, and worked together at many times to try to push those issues forward. So, um, but, but I think there are a couple of critical things before getting to the specifics. One of them is that um, there's always, always going to be, I think, a hierarchy of needs and issues and even of um, due process in terms of which responsibilities do you meet first, how do you go about doing them, uh, sometimes ensuring the health and safety broadly takes precedence over um, the specific food item that may be served 
or um, how, how uh, free and easy movement overall is in a particular facility. Um, so our officers at both CBP and ICE and the policies that go into determining how people are interviewed um, detained, uh, released, all of those things are incredibly complicated. And we have taken very seriously claims that, that, that various policies and, and programs are not individualized enough. And we're constantly working with our, with our agencies to try to ensure that we're striking that right balance. But I think it will always, always be a balance. And I think it's important to make that point, that they are juggling an enormous uh, quantity of issues, trying to keep foremost in our minds the importance of treating each person with respect and dignity, but also trying to struggle with the fact that 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 smuggling, that trafficking, that any number of other issues that they are also dealing with at the same time become considerations as well. Now, with respect to issues like what are children fed, yes, I have seen hamburgers, but I've also seen carrots and juice and a, and a variety of other um, foods available. And I think what's important here is that there are issues about cultural sensitivity, different kinds of food, different kinds of things that people need, different health concerns that may arise. And again, I think that that overall DHS has tried to be very responsive to those concerns. But more importantly, um, uh, Secretary Johnson ensured that we would have a um, federal advisory committee established um, precisely to, I think, get more outside and expert advice about the nature of, of ways that things could be improved. So if you start from the baseline that I do think that people of goodwill are trying to do the best they can with the resources they have, and that they are continuing to try to engage to Im improve as much as possible um, the, the, um, the facilities, the circumstances, the uh, manner in which people are released. I think all of those things have to, have to be sort of balanced against you know, the concerns that have been raised by the petitioners. And as I said, many of the specific concerns are things that actually we are litigating, which I think is a nod to the great due process system that we have in the US, that when these issues are not um, when, when people don't agree on the underlying philosophy or what the law means, we have mechanisms to challenge them. It's unfortunate that these things take time, but we do have the mechanisms to, to, to try to find resolution. Can you do your answer in 20 seconds? Sorry, certainly. <laughs> So um, we're, we're sure. out of time. on behalf of HHS, um, as was stated earlier, we only um, serve the unaccompanied children. And um, those children that come into our care, we do, um, we do have a variety of rules and laws that we must follow. And we basically approach the, the treatment of the care um, of the children as in their best interest is the standard we use and the least restrictive environment. Um, we do um, try to employ cultural sensitivity in you know, the diet to, to activities throughout, throughout our programs. So thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you to both sides. Um, I, 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 we, well, I think we're all aware that the, the problems like this, um, situations like this, is, is finding the right balance and having the political will to try and, and solve whatever problems exist in the systems that we use and have set up and that we must always put the interest of the children, the women, who I'm particularly interested in, because without women, you wouldn't have children. Uh, and then the world will come to an end. Uh, um, and the f um, families, this basic unit of all societies. Uh, um, so with political will and with our assistance, the Commission, we hope we'll be able to assist to move this forward. With that, I thank you and call this hearing to an end.